This is, a, this is an amazing place to visit. Um, I don't know if you know this, but your city is incredible and it feels so futuristic to come here. Um, and I know that it seems normal to you, but today what I want to talk about is the idea um, of playing to learn. And the more I started thinking about this title, uh, the more I really wanted to change the title. And I think a better way to think about it is to play is to learn. I was in Africa this fall and I was out on the, on the savanna and there's a cheetah and uh, we're watching this cheetah mother and she's got three cubs and the cubs are just messing around. They keep running after each other and tackling each other and she was just sitting there keeping an eye on everything. And I started to realize that what they were doing was playing around, but what they're really doing is learning. Um, they're learning what it is to be a cheetah. And so today, I want to talk about the future of education. And I think the best way to talk about the future of education is to share stories of what works and what doesn't. But before I do that, I want to talk about showers. And so this is a picture of my shower back in uh, the United States. And it's a pretty simple shower. At the top, it's got one button or one knob that regulates the amount of hot water that goes into my shower. Um, it's got another knob that tells me how much cold water I'm getting. But then at the bottom, there's a diverter. And what the diverter can do is it can move the water from the bathtub into the shower. And I've been using this shower for a long time, and I'm pretty good at using the shower. Uh, it seems pretty normal to me. Um, but I've been traveling quite a bit over the last year, and what I've realized is that there's lots of different ways that we could design a shower. This is a shower that I took in South America. I don't know if you've taken one of these. There is no hot or cold water. There's simply cold water, and then they wrap wire around the pipe, and they plug it into the wall. And so it heats it up a little bit. It seems like a really efficient design. The problem is that people will go into the shower and they hang their clothes on the shower, and so then you get a short in the wire. And so when you're taking a shower, you're covered in water, but you're also covered in electricity, um, which is bad. This is a shower that I took in Alaska. You may have taken one of these before. I was adjusting the temperature, and I got it just right. And then I realized that I had no idea how to turn the shower on. And uh, there's no diverter on the top of it. And I was about to get out of the shower, and then I realized that there was a warning sticker on the side of the shower that said, if you want to turn the shower on, what you do is you adjust the temperature and then you have to pull down. There's a spout ring underneath it and that's how you turn on the shower. So I realized I was an idiot, but I also realized that that would be bad design. Uh, in other words, it should be apparent me to me how that shower is going to work. This is a shower I took in Montana. This is where I'm from. I still have no idea how to turn that shower on. It's like a matrix. You have to have all the knobs going in the right direction. This is a shower I took outside of Chicago. I thought this seemed like an interesting shower. So what I could do is I could adjust the temperature and I didn't have to get into the bathtub. But then once I got the temperature right and I got into the bathtub and I closed the curtain, then I realized that the temperature wasn't quite right. And so I had to open the curtain and then the water went everywhere. So bad design. I then realized that this was made this way because it was a handicapped accessible shower. And I have a friend who's in a wheelchair, and she said, you have no idea how bad shower design is until you've been there. This is a shower that I took in Abu Dhabi uh, a few weeks ago. This is the first time I'd ever seen a push-button shower. I don't know if you've seen these before. Essentially, you turn on the temperature, and then you hit the button, and it just clicks on. Um, seems like a really cool idea. The problem is that you can't unpush the button. Um, it's using the flow of the water to turn it on, so you have to turn off the water. I also was kind of confused because I'm standing in a shower, so it seemed puzzling that there would be a button for a shower. So I hit the button, of course, and I realized that there was another shower that I didn't see, like <laughs> above my head. And this shower had a totally different set of, of temperature, so it was really cold. Now this is a shower that I took in Dubai about a little, a little over a week ago. I don't know if you've seen one of these. I was super excited about it. One of the most beautiful showers that I'd ever taken. Um, it seemed new, but when I got in there, it was just terrible. 
So it had a push button shower. So by pushing it, I couldn't unpush it. Also, they'd taken those knobs that I had in my shower back home and they articulated those 90 degrees to the left and to the right. So if I would move them in the same direction, I had the opposite kind of an effect. And also when you move it, small little movements in that knob resulted in huge changes in the temperature. And so it took me like three minutes to get the temperature right when I was in that shower. And so I would say, beautiful shower, really cool design, but didn't work for me. And so why am I talking about showers? Well, I think we need to understand that there's almost an infinite number of ways that you could make a shower. It's design, it's engineering. But really, what's causing those different, those different designs are these, what I'll call these three constraints. And so the first one is the technology. And so that's going to be the feasibility. So can you actually make something that moves water here and then moves water up here? We then have the business side of it. And so I'll call that the viability. So can we produce them for a cost? And then can we make money on that? Or the hotel, can they install them in all the rooms and make money on it? And then I would say with the shower designs, this is kind of where it ends a lot of the time. Can we do it? And can we make money on it? And I think what they're missing a lot of the time is the human element. Like, has somebody actually got in the shower and tried it? And does it work? And so I'm a human, spoiler alert, I'm a human. And so I think for me, that's what I have to offer when it comes to the future of education. Because I've been a teacher for the last 20 years. And so I've been a science teacher in the, in the States. Um, and I noticed a problem in my teaching that for almost all of my years of teaching, I was standing in the front of the classroom like this, running the show. And that I would come up with these really engaging lessons and come up with, with labs, but I was in charge of everything. And the problem is that when I would work individually with students on a one-to-one -one layer, then I was more efficient as a teacher. In other words, I could hear what was making sense to them, they could ask me questions. And so this is like the shower problem. It's more complex though, because it involves their brain, my brain, all these interactions between us. And so how could I be that teacher that I am at the mentor level, but how does that scale to the classroom level? And so I had a problem and I had to come up with a solution. But if you know anything about design, there's never a straight line from problem to solution. In fact, a better way to look at it is like this. You're going to move towards the solution, and then you're going to move back again. And so for me, what I really needed was a place to start. So how do I begin to tackle this question? And for me, what I saw is that the answer lay in video games. Students in my class who were bored in class, were not engaged in class, just an hour later would be playing a video game, and they were totally engaged in the video game. And I started to think, like, what's the difference between a video game and my class? There's really no difference between the two. You're acquiring a skill, you're developing that skill, and then you're applying the skill over time. And so what I thought is I would take games as a way to redesign my classroom. And when you tell people this, they get really excited about the word game and that you're using gaming in your classroom. And in fact, they want to talk about badges and badge systems and gamification. And there are so many articles that have been written about this. And there's a lot of buzz going around about gamification. But going back to the shower analogy again, this is in the technology realm and in the business realm. And for me, what I really wanted to see is would it work? And so this is what it looked like in my brain. That I wanted to use the game as a way for me to redesign my classroom so it could be more efficient. And so gamification has some elements to it. What gamification really is, is not playing games, but it's taking the elements of games and applying those in the real world. And so the elements of gamification are very simple. You have some kind of an action. Has everybody played Angry Birds or you know what Angry Birds is? All right, so in Angry Birds, what you do is you launch a bird at pigs in buildings. This might be confusing, but stick with it. So you launch the birds. If they knock over the building, you get points. If you get enough points, then you clear a level and you get a badge. And there's always in really effective video games some kind of a social component where either you can compete against other people's scores or a multiplayer game is going to be the best. And so for me, what, did I, what I needed to do was figure out what were the kids going to do in my class. 
again, solving that problem of how can I be individually with each of them. And so I had something that teachers love, and it was called summer. And so all summer I worked. And so I made about 100, NVIDIA, 100 videos that would take the students through the content in my class. It would also explain the labs that we were going to do so I wouldn't have to stand in the front and run the lab. Kids would just watch the video, they'd grab the lab equipment, and then they'd go into it. I then had to create a point system, and so the students would complete these actions, and then they would get points. I also had a badging system, and so I'm a biology teacher, and so every kid in the class started at level uh, one. They all were primordial soup, and they would start to gain points for each of the accomplishments that they did. And they could work their way up to water bear and then maybe to mountain gorilla. I also had a leaderboard in the class. And so the kids would play with an avatar. So that was a name that only they knew and they could see where they were in the class and where they were, they were in, uh, in, in relation to everybody else in the class. And the different colors up here are going to be the different periods. And so kids across all my periods were competing with each other. And so all summer I worked on this and finally it was the first day of class. I've never been this scared in my whole life. I stood up in the front of the class on the first day and I said, hello, welcome to AP Biology. I'm your teacher, Mr. Anderson, and my class is like a video game. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna get out of the way and I'd like you to come up. Um, we had iPads in the classroom. They'd grab an iPad and they had to watch a video and that would take them into the class. And I really was doing what teachers always hope to do. Instead of being a sage on the stage, like I am right now, I wanted to be a guide on the side. And I would love to tell you how great it was. And it was the best teaching that I'd ever done. It really was. But there were some mint, like, small things that went wrong. Like, guess what happens when every kid in your class is watching a video on the same time? The Wi-Fi goes down. So that night, I had to go in. I had to take every video and load it onto the iPad so it would be ready to go the next day. But the year went on, and as I looked back on it, like this is really what that leap looked like that I took as a teacher. There were some things that I didn't think about. And so these are what I want to share with you today. Like number one, I didn't prepare my kids to learn how to learn. So what did my classroom used to look like? It was like a school bus where I would load all the students up on the first day of the school year and I would drive them safely to the end of the year. But now what I was essentially saying is you each get a car, just go drive. And so some of the kids fell behind and some of the kids raced ahead and some of them crashed. And so I hadn't prepared them to learn on their own. The second thing I learned is that my students had varying abilities in reading comprehension. So many of my kids didn't know how to read effectively. Now this seems puzzling to me. Why was it that they weren't reading? Well, it's because I was reading the book to them. What I was doing was reading the book, coming up with good graphics and, and metaphors and explaining it to them so they didn't have to read the book. I was essentially reading it for them. But then the scariest thing about that year as I look back on it is that I never felt so sad as a teacher as I did that year. I felt disconnected from my class. I didn't feel like they were my class. And so I felt after that first year that I was here. I was closer to the solution, but I'd moved away in certain areas. And so what did I have to do in that next year? I had to tackle those three problems. And so what's the first thing I did? On day one, I taught my kids how to read. This is how you read a science book, and we went through the skills of reading. What did I do next? I taught them how to learn. And I taught them, where should you be in group size when it comes to learning? In other words, should you be by yourself? Should you be by other people? And it was so important to me that they knew that, that I even came up with a silly poem that taught them how to learn. And it goes like this. One is for learning, private and active. Two is for teaching, it goes both ways. Three is for working, the job divided. Four is for nothing but wasting the days. In other words, if you want to learn something, you should be by yourself focused. And I created in my classroom areas for learning where they could wear these big headphones and they'd be shielded from everything around them. And they could read or they could watch a video. I then told them, if you want to teach something, the best number is you and me. 
So the two of us. And so I built another area in my classroom where they would meet with me or meet with me in small groups. That's what teaching really is. When they were doing labs, groups of three worked well. When there were groups of four, that indicated to me as a teacher that they weren't doing anything. And I had to get there and I had to clean that up right away. And then I moved forward to another year. And then I realized I've created so much stuff in my classroom that is one way. In other words, a video is one way. I'm giving direction in one way, but there's no way for me to figure out where the students are. And so what's the best way to figure out where students are? You ask them questions. And so that next year became the year of me writing question after question after question. And every new way to revolutionize education, we've heard of all of these things, like the Khan Academy would be a good example. They always revolve around mathematics and computer science. And the reason why is they can put one question there, and then they simply change the number, and they can have an infinite number of questions. But how do you do that in a science class, or how do you do that in a psychology class? It's much more difficult. And so year after year, I'm moving closer and closer to a solution, but the key thing is you have to try it. You never figure out what's going to work unless you're brave enough to kind of give it a shot. And so people keep asking me, what does the future classroom look like? I would say it's not going to look like this. It's not going to be students sitting plugged in. Virtual reality may be a part of the new classroom, but kids don't want to go to a school where they're just sitting there immersed in technology. I hope it doesn't look like this with one person in the front of the classroom doing all the talking. Like, there's a really good way to figure out who's learning in a classroom. It's the person who's talking. Like, who's learning right now? Me. I'm just talking, but I've given thought to this. When will you really be learning? It's when you're engaging with me in discussion. That's when learning occurs. And I do think we have really good indicators of what a future classroom might look like, they're like this, like a wood shop, where you're learning some skills and then you're working on a project. Or an art studio, where you're learning skills and working on an art installation. Do you really want to know what a future classroom looks like? It's what your job is. Imagine what your job is right now. What do you do? You solve problems, you work with people, communication is a huge part of that, so take that job and then put that in the schools, and that's what schools are gonna look like. A lot of people ask me, what's the role of technology then? What's technology going to do? Well, I think what it did for me is it allowed me to be in more than one place at a time. I could give a lecture here, I could prepare them for a lab here, but I could actually talk to them here. Another part of technology that's neat is that it scales. I created these 100 videos for my students and then I just put them on YouTube. And now they're used by thousands of students and thousands of teachers around the world. I also wanted to make sure that my videos were accessible to all the students in my class. And I had students who were deaf. And if they're deaf, they can't hear what you're saying. So you have to accurately transcribe all your videos into English. And the moment I did that, and I put it on YouTube, tons of volunteers out there on the internet have translated those into a number of different languages. Technology also motivates. Does anybody have an activity tracker like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch that tracks what you do? You know that motivates you. This is my wife. It's snowy in Montana right now, but it still gets us out and being active. And if you have one of these, you've probably had this situation where you go for a walk and you forgot it at home, and you're not sure if you want to go back to get it because these, are they going to count or are they not going to count? I think technology, in the best way, connects us to other people. Like, this is compelling to me. This is compelling to all of us, the smartphone. But it's not the technology that's in here. What makes it compelling? This is where the people I love are. This is where my wife is. This is where my kids are. And that's what technology can do in the classroom. It allowed me to connect to my students. And if I had to eliminate one of those two things, I'd get rid of all the technology. The people is what's most important. So what is video? because there's a lot of talk around that, I would say that video is not a teacher. It's not. It's just, what, it's just one dimensional. There's no back, back and forth. And so what's a good analogy for what video is? I would say video is a new type of book. And virtual reality is a new type of book. And gamification is a new type of book. 
And guess what? Books are always going to be around. And that's a new kind of book as well. And speaking of books, I wanted to show you one of the first books that I ever got. This is me getting a book from my mom. And this is called Insects Do the Strangest Things. Because I'd already read mammals do the strangest things and reptiles do the strangest things and dinosaurs do the strangest things. But it wasn't the book that was compelling. It was my mom that was compelling. It's the person behind the technology. Do I trust them and, they, and do they value me? And so as we move forward to find a new education system, I think we have to realize that the most important part of all of this is the human. So thank you guys very much.